Toby taught the uh, beginning of this last week, did a real good job on it. I left here and he made me think about things a little bit differently than what I had. And uh, there's still some thoughts that I had on it. I had to pray hard on it Wednesday night. God gave me something. This morning, Zach confirmed it. Uh, chapter 21 is dedicated, in my opinion, to the threefold denial that Peter when he denied Christ <laughs> just before his crucifixion. You got a whole you got a whole chapter on the restoration of Peter. Not only of Peter, but the other disciples too. But typically when I've done something wrong, because I Ronnie had said something a couple of weeks ago during a devotional that made me think of this. He was think he was saying that, that how good God is and how he never he'll never leave you or, or forsake you. And he was saying that your friends will fail you sometimes. And that's the truth. But the other truth is, is that is we can fail our friends. I've probably been that one before. And so you got seven of the disciples out on the ship or out on the sea or out on a fishing boat. You got one who denied Christ and one who doubted him. Mm-hmm. Judas had already betrayed him, but he wasn't it, he wasn't part of it. But they're out there fishing, they're out there all night long, hadn't caught anything. And I don't know if by a show of hands of how many of you in here has ever fished for more than two or three hours and hadn't caught anything. Yeah. I don't have to tell you how boring it is. <laughs> it's boring. And uh, if you're like me when I'm bored, that's when thoughts start going through my mind of how especially I've messed up, what I could have done to make things better. Mm-hmm. You got all kind of thoughts going on in your mind. But they're out there. No doubt Peter, if you know Peter, if Peter's anything like me, Peter's beating himself down for the denial. He's beating himself down. He's thought, man, why? I've done it big this time. He's thought, can I ever rebound from this? Is there any hope for me? Why? You got Thomas. Man, I can't believe I doubted him. Of all that I've seen, he raised Lazarus from the dead. <laughs> Jairus' his daughter from the dead. We I'm Dallas. And you know, at least one of them said, Boy, you can't believe old Judas. I'm glad I'm not him. Amen. At least one of them said that. Yeah. Maybe all of them did. Maybe all of them concurred. At least we didn't go as far as Judas did. But they did. You're right. There's just a difference. But as they're out there on that fishing boat, they hear a, a voice, have you caught any meat? Do you have any meat? Do you have you caught any fish? Only one single word was replied, no. That's usually grouchy. <laughs> you just respond with a simple no. Yeah. It's usually unpleasant, it's usually grouchy. Yeah. yeah. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. <laughs> they're aggravated, they're in deep thought. Smart Alex. But Jesus tells them to throw, cast the net over on the other side like, Toby said, and they started catching fish right off the bat. But what God gave me Wednesday night, and I'm laying in the bed and I can't think right, and I started praying. While they're out there beating themselves down, saying, I, I've went too far, Jesus is preparing a table for them. Yeah, yeah. you're right, man. Yeah. He sent out an invitation said come and die. Amen. Peter hears that voice. He takes off running. While he's running inside, Jesus is preparing a table. Mm-hmm. You're right. And I thought about that. He, he's preparing Peter a table. Of all Peter had done wrong, he denied him three times. Come on. Man. Goes back further than that. Come on. He's still preparing a table. Amen. I went a little different on this. You know, several chapters before this, Peter's probably singing that song, Fill My Cup, Lord, I Lift It Up. Yes. Right now he's saying, Fix My Cup, Lord, I've messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I've sung that song once or twice, but several times. 
<clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, come unto me. In chapter 16 of Matthew, he says, come after me. Mm. Come on in. I really think that this lesson had everything to do with the restoration of Peter. Yeah. God had already made him a promise. He wasn't finished with him. Despite all these faults and failures, God wasn't finished with Peter. Come on, but I thought about Wednesday night when I was laying there. As, as Peter's more than likely having a private conversation with Christ, Christ reminded him of the cost of discipleship. And he asked him, have you counted the cost, Peter? Because mm -hmm. yeah. in Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 26, the Bible says, If any man come unto me, hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brethren and sister, and his own self, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his own cross cannot be my, cannot be my disciple. Question. For which of you intending to build a tower Setteth not down first and counts the cost to see if he has sufficient to build, lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and was unable to build, all that behold him begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was unable to finish. Amen. And I ask you here this morning if you counted the cost. I want to say that when Jesus said that, he didn't leave any fine print. And I've often been discouraged by reading that until I fully understand it. Jesus isn't breaking the commandment and saying you need to hate your father and your family. He's not. Because salvation, it's free. It's not a uh, reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. Amen. Yes. But God demands, he, he demands that discipline that you serve him first. Amen. And like I said, he's not going against the commandment to tell you to hate somebody. Because the true mark of a Christian is the love of God. Amen. Amen. And I'll say this, if I put God first, I can love my wife, Amen. I can love my mom and dad, yes. yeah. my mother-in-law and father-in-law and my church yes. much better. You're right, Andy. You're right, sir. You're right. I can love my family and my church much better by making them number two in my life than I could ever make Amen. them at number one. Because, like I said, the true mark of a Christian is the love of God. And if you love God, you'll love everything else. Yes, you're right. Eddie. It's not about self-fulfillment. But the true gospel, what Jesus is saying here, the true gospel is self-denial. Mm -hmm. Self-denial. Luke chapter 9, verse, six, <clears throat> verse 62. No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Jesus is just stressing the importance of counting the cost of discipleship. And I asked you again this morning if you counted the cost. Because there was a cost for Peter. Jesus reminded him of that. Peter's known he's been a disciple for over three years. Christ had plans for him, but he had to be restored first. And if you think about it, each and every one of us in here has to think, Peter, for that the gospel was provided to the Gentiles. He's the one through Christ that opened the door right. for us. And if you remember back in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked the disciples, Who does men say that I am? They answered, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elisha, some say Jeremiah, or one of the other disciples or <coughs> prophets. Peter says, who do you say that I am? Or yeah. Christ says, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah. Help me, boy. Yeah. That was his answer. Yes. And that's what God had, to, or Christ had to remind Peter of this day because he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen. But again, Peter had to be restored. Because if you think about it, the restoration of Peter was most important to all of us, to the church. Amen. 
it was critical to the leadership of the other disciples mm -hmm. and for the ministry, and especially after the ascension of Jesus Christ. The disciples would also need to be able to trust Peter. Mm -hmm. They've seen him denying. They've seen him forsaking. They also needed, every one of them needed restored. Mm -hmm. Peter needed to know that although he had forsaken Christ, Christ would never forsaken him. Right. Right. And that's what this is about. Yes. So as Toby taught, Peter and the disciples go back to fishing. So why do you think they went back to fishing? Was it because they lost their faith? And this is what Toby brought out that I thought on a little bit more. Or was it they lost track of what they were called to do? Or was it out of frustration? I think probably a little bit of all. <laughs> Jesus had been crucified. He had been resurrected from the grave. And after the resurrection, Christ's relationship with the disciples was never going to be the same again. It'll never be the same again. They walked with this man daily. They watched the miracles. And after his after he was raised from the dead, he's only there 40 days. This is the third meeting as a whole that Christ had with the disciples. They no longer had that day day by day one on one intimate relationship with Christ that they once right. had. They're used to following Christ. They're used to being near him. They had a personal relationship yeah. yes. probably daily with him. Amen. And so Think about it that way. Somebody that you follow, it's hard for us to it's hard for us to understand death. We lose a loved one, think of how you are with them. And that's how they are with Christ, probably even more. They've seen this man do countless miracles. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they've lost that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they think. <laughs> so I thought about it like this. Jesus called you to be a disciple. You left all you had. You left all you knew to follow him. You're hoping for a new prominent kingdom. Mm -hmm. Not only are you hoping for a new prominent kingdom, they were hoping to have an appointed position <laughs> in that kingdom. Yes. They had hope for yeah. that. But he's yeah, he's been they've been promised. But he's murdered, hung on a cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. No matter how you look at this, we could all sit and say, man, as much as Thomas saw out of Christ, how did he doubt? As much as Peter saw out of Christ, how does he deny him? Have you ever taken God for granted? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have. <laughs> and that's all this is about. Yep. Yeah. Yes. You're they right. took him for granted. Everything that he said, he tried to tell them peacefully. I mean, you got you got uh, Christ saying, "Whither I go, you cannot go, but afterwards you can go." Peter says, "Lord, why can't I go now?" <laughs> he says, "I'll lay. I'm willing to lay my life down for your sake." Well, Peter would later, but I don't know that he meant it at this point. So they had questions. They're frustrated. I'm sure they're asking questions like, what's going to happen next? Is the kingdom to begin now? Are we still disciples? Or what's our relationship with Christ like now? What does the Lord want me to do now? Not to go back fishing. If I go and preach, what message do I preach? <laughs> if I'm not to preach, what do I do? Or do we return to our former professions? Yep. So they all decided to go fishing. Mm -hmm. Start at verse 15. So when <clears throat> they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, but thou knowest that I love thee. He hath unto him, he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, 
Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And very, verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And this he spake, signifying what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. It's pretty big words. Yeah. Yes. It says, son, or Simon, son of Jonas. Jesus, if you think back, Jesus often referred to him as, as uh, Simon, son of our Jonas, when he formerly acted like himself. <laughs> he had named him Peter. Peter when he's doing good. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these other disciples? Do you love me more than fishing? <laughs> do you love me more than that old boat and those nets? And he says, yeah, I do. There's two different, in the Greek, there's two different loves mm -hmm. that's used here in this text. There's a agape love. That's a divine love that, in my opinion, only God can give. Right. And probably the closest thing to it is what a parents, how the parents love their children. And then there's a second translation to it. It's phileo love. And that's a love of a lesser degree. When Jesus asked him the first time, he says, do you agape love me? Do you love me? Do you have a divine love for me? But Peter's response every time was, I phileo love you. It's a, of a lesser love. <laughs> well, the third time that Jesus said, do you love me? He used the phileo love. Do you phileo love me? So the lesson at that time when Peter, it really hit him of my weakness and my failure. Yeah. And he says, yeah, Lord, of all things, you know that I love you. Mm -hmm. Peter realized his weakness. Yeah. Mm. So three times Peter had denied Christ. Three times Christ asked, do you love me? <laughs> the meeting reaffirmed to Peter of his calling that Christ had called him to do. Yes. Peter would... <clears throat> Peter would continue to be a fisherman of men. Mm -hmm. It also reassured the disciples that Christ, although not in the physical sense, would still be with them. Mm -hmm. It promised them guidance and the power to evangelize through the Holy Spirit. The death and resurrection of Christ didn't change the calling of any of the disciples to be seekers of men. Jesus reminded Peter he must not only seek men's souls, but he must also shepherd them. Sheep need two things. They need fed and they need led. <laughs> so in verse 18, when verily, verily, verily I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, when Peter was young, he was in control of his own actions. Mm -hmm. Peter did as he pleased. He went where he wanted to go. Right. He had his own free will. Then another shall gird thee, men they would seize Peter. When you get arrested and you put hand, you're handcuffed, you've lost your freedom. Yeah. You don't do as you please. You do as the one that arrested you pleases you to do. You're subject to their will. Amen. And Peter would die a martyr's death. The Bible says he stretched forth his hands would meant that he'd be crucified. So Peter spent the next 30 years of his life serving God in a mighty way, but he also spent the next 30 years of his life living in the shadow of the cross. Because Peter would eventually fall victim to Nero, and as historians say, he requested to be crucified upside down. 
Christ had promised Peter that regardless of all of his faults and failures, he'd glorify God in his death. So Peter paid the cost. He counted the cost, even in the death. Peter took up his cross. He lost his own life to find his. Amen. He denied himself. He was forsaking all he had to follow Christ after this point. And you have to ask yourself, are we willing to do that? But I asked you, have you counted the cost? If you're here this morning and you haven't counted the cost, have you counted the cost of not follow Jesus? Because it's something you can't pay back. Right. You, you'll lose every time. And right. it's an eternal loss. It's a much bigger cost not to follow Jesus. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, you'll share more in the unpopularity of Jesus than you'll ever share in the popularity of Jesus. Uh, it's not always a popular. You're right. It's not always a popular thing to follow to be a disciple of Jesus. You're right. Uh, to be a Christian. Period. Um, I remember a few months ago on the phone with Jimmy Mitchell, we were talking about different things, and I, you know, and half of it, it's a respect thing. I know what it's like to walk in an office, everybody laughing, and you say, hey, what are y'all laughing at? And it's something, well, you probably don't want to know. And, you know, and I I respect that. Amen. Uh, at least they're respectful enough not to go on with the conversation. That's but, right, uh, you don't in, You're not included in a lot of things. Jimmy says, hey, man, you're not as popular as you used to be. And, <laughs> and, uh, I'm fine with that. Yes, you are, too. <laughs> All the angels in heaven know you. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll never have... <clears throat> You'll never have true peace. That's one of the things. You'll never have true peace in your life unless you follow Christ. That's right. And I mean that. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Neither let it be afraid. But you'll never have complete joy in your life if you don't follow Jesus. Amen. Oh, yeah. You're right there, Amen. Peter said, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. But most of all, if you don't follow Christ, I really truly believe you'll never know your full purpose. That's right. Your, your, your true intended purpose of life. You're right, man. If you don't follow Christ. Amen. Because Paul said in Romans that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. For each and everybody here, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, I went a different way with this on the cost of discipleship, and I've asked, have you counted the cost to be a Christian? And have you had it counted the cost not to be? Jesus counted the cost. Oh, yeah. I believe I believe when he was in the garden, he began to count the cost. And he counted the cost of every sin that's ever been committed in here. But not only did he count the cost when he hung there on that cross, he paid the cost of our sin. Amen. Amen. And that's my lesson. Bless you, my dear.